All right. Good morning, everybody. It's 10 a.m. here in Denver, Colorado. So we're going to start this week's traditional coffee break. I hope your cups are full. My name is Cutter Balance, and I work in the building automation group here at Long. With me on the line, I have Andrew Blavelt, who is with Building OS, and they are one of our strategic partners in the cloud analytical space. So the topic for today is going to be the built environment and the big data transformation. Andrew and I are going to unpack that here in a moment. Before we do, since it is early in the morning, I want to start off with a little knee slapper. It's an oldie but goodie. Does anybody out there know what happens when you start playing country music backwards? The dog comes home, the wife doesn't divorce you, and the whiskey bottle fills up. I know, cheesy, but they're always fun. All right, Andrew, welcome to the show. First off, I'd like you to tell us just a little bit about yourself in the Building OS platform, um, specifically um, how Building OS fits in with the Acuity lineup. Um, I know Acuity has several different branches, one of which is Disk Tech Controls um, that Long uses on a regular basis for our turnkey system integrations. Welcome to the show, Andrew. Thanks, Cutter. Great to be here. Uh, my name is Andrew Blobels. I am the VP of Sales for the Building OS product at Acuity Brands. Uh, really, our product um, is aligned to the top tier of the uh, Acuity Brands acquisition strategy. We've been a part of Acuity for uh, almost three years now, three years um, next month. Uh, and, and we've really kind of uh, been included into the Atrius product line. So if you've seen, you know, the work we're doing at Target with indoor positioning, uh, it's really that, that top tier of, of bringing up all that data from our downstream devices, whether it be Distech, Enlight, or, you know, really any of our, um, you know, uh, physical Luminear solutions. Uh, but we also integrate a lot of other data and we, we really work with uh, partners like Long to provide a, a seamless uh, layer over top of a lot of different systems which we'll talk to today. Um, and, and really kind of give that, you know, single pane of glass, as we like to say, um, over top of, you know, your, your, your various downstream um, devices and, and systems. And, and that really helps us from a, 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 a workflow perspective of, of making sure that, you know, everybody from building operations is working in, in one team, whether it be, um, you know, your, your management, your, your operations, your um, your sustainability groups, um, all working with one platform. Um, and we really alleviate a lot of those manual processes around you know, data collection from different building automation systems, metering systems, you know, the different utility providers even. Um, and then we provide um, data quality analytics. We, we make sure that that data is okay. We backfill historically uh, baseline data um, to make sure that you're getting a complete picture. Um, and then we, you know, really give visibility through world-class reporting um, and of normalized data sets. And that really starts at your highest level um, at the utility bills, you know, moving into submeters, uh, building automation data, you know, really anything from renewables, IoT, which in my mind is really just building automation. Uh, but there's a, a lot of stuff that's coming out that's edge to cloud. Um, and then ass order, asset and work order data. So really getting life cycle analysis data um, around your physical assets and creating a, a digital twin in the, in the form of you know, data in the cloud and knowing what it is you know, what type of system it's, you know, involved in, and then, you know, kind of that entire, um, you know, that entire ecosystem built into the cloud. And then we run a lot of cool things um, in the background to, to let you know that, you know, things are running the way they should. We, we create uh, machine learning models of every system sensor, um, every point in our system uh, is, is applied that, that model. Uh, and then we normalize it to cost, price, um, you know, provide reporting, um, uh, alerts, and, and schedule delivery of those alerts and, and your, your various reports. And then it, it's all wrapped into one um, platform that you can see more of a hierarchy of all your data in it um, that's, that's featured, uh, again, in the cloud. It's an excellent segue there, Andrew. Sounds like you're a, quite the powerful platform. Um, lately, I have noticed that many state and local governments are starting to mandate a lot of this uh, documented, accurate data. Um, in addition, it's starting to become more and more popular in the private sector. Um, can you speak to how we gather this data um, and what the value of a accurate data set is um, related to uh, local state requirements, um, as well as the private sector and, um, and how it can 
ultimately benefit their organization? Yeah, definitely. That's a great question. So one of the biggest uh, requirements we're seeing from customers lately is around uh, GHG emissions reporting. Uh, we do support um, scope one, scope two, and scope three emissions reporting, as well as Energy Star Portfolio Manager, which I know is a, a local requirement. Um, I think it's any building above 50,000 square feet in, in Denver. Uh, and, and we automate that process, collect the bills, go up, talk to the, the uh, the API of Energy Star Portfolio Manager, populate that monthly, pull it back down and display it in your building, um, which, you know, when you think about that process, it's very manual, you know, it's a lot of, you know, pulling data off of your bills. It's a lot of, you know, taking that and, and then applying the calculations, those emissions uh, accounting changes almost every other year. So you have to know which uh, year to align that to. And then you have, you know, in scope three, becoming even more prevalent, you know, just a myriad of different ways of accounting for it, even stuff like, you know, your the difference in a first class flight to a second class flight. So it can kind of go up and down. Um, and, 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 and we see that being a very, uh, you know, a very manual process and, and through our tooling and our integrations, you know, we really make this something where you're going from a, a, a process of pulling that in, applying your calculations a lot of times in, you know, Excel and, you know, we make it all automated. So you can, you know, rather than, you know, focusing on the, the process, you're really focusing on, you know, new, um, you know, opportunities for saving more value added tasks um, are really around, you know, you know, making sure that you hit those targets. Excellent, Andrew. Yeah, I've definitely been in uh, certain organizations where they have pages and pages of spreadsheets and they're entering all this data in. Um, and I just, I really don't see a way that a lot of that can be accurate um, at the end of the day. So thank you for, for sharing uh, with the audience on that. So next question that we're gonna get into, it wouldn't be close to the one year anniversary of COVID uh, without asking it. So here we go. Um, it's obviously been an unexpected year, lots of challenges. Uh, can you talk about how COVID-19 is impacting energy um, consumption levels uh, related to occupancy, as well as new requirements from ASHRAE? Um, and they kind of set, roll that up into uh, how the Building OS platform uh, manages that. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Uh, we've seen this come up uh, across all of our partners, customers. You know, how do I make sure that I'm doing the right things in a time where you know I, I you know, you, you can't do year over year anymore. There's no way to say you know 2019 is anything like 2020. 2020 is going to be anything like 2021. Um, you know, it was, 2020 was probably the most challenging year in modern history for anticipating and forecasting energy consumption. I know our team at Acuity Brands was trying to figure it out because we had no one in the office. Um, and because of that, the data is skewed to the point where we can't really plan for future usage. Like, you know, think about 20 to 2021. And we're not using any of that data to plan for 2021 because there's likely going to be, you know, a lot more ventilation causing actually higher. So it's this weird dip and you've got a lot of companies and, and organizations that have planned 2021 as a year um, to baseline off of or as a year as a target. So if you're going in and 2020 was the time you're trying to hit, you know, percentage reduction in savings, you're looking like a rock star, but is that really the case? And, you know, moving into 2021, you know, how do you say that those additional um, energy usage isn't more than you should expect when, in, you know, when looking at those variables, which you mentioned around occupancy, airflow, weather, you know, we've got a lot of crazy stuff going on. Um, you, know, you know, I think there's a big storm flying through the country right now. Um, and, you know, we, we, we had taken this on at Acuity and I actually pulled some data from our, one of our sites um, looking at, uh, you know, how these respective variables affect your calculations of savings. Um, and, and with our platform, um, we automatically apply machine learning basis, uh, baselines and, and that actually are forecasted into the, the next uh, 10 days, um, which allow you to look at, you know, the different variables. I think we use about 17 different variables and then um, we, that, that, that algorithm learns up to every 15 minutes. And um, in this case, you know, you can see the year over year on the left, um, we're really seeing that, you know, we're, we're expecting a quite a bit of savings and we're, we're realizing quite a bit of savings based on the previous year. But if we look at the middle um, graph here, you know, we're layering in just the weather data and given weather alone, you know, that's already dropped to 10%. But now if you look at weather plus occupancy, and I've kind of taken these different baselines and, and made them my own um, to, to prove a point here, but you know, we're only down 1.5%. 
<laughs> and, and that's that's taking into all of the the variables into account and we're not doing as good as we thought we were and we better plan for next year because next year we're going to have to probably double our oa and and really kind of cycle that air throughout so we got to be prepared well it's quite the compelling chart there andrea so if i'm if i'm reading it correctly uh, on the far left of the uh, data set was being used um, that was not normalized and did not have a, a quality R, R squared number, Acuity would have thought that they absolutely knocked it out of the park this year as far as energy saving goes. But once we run it through all the normalization uh, equations, we see that we actually didn't save all that much. And for 2021, um, perhaps some different energy measures uh, or occupancy measures need to be taken, implemented to achieve those goals. Am I understanding that correctly? Yeah, definitely. You know, an energy manager thinks he's doing really well, and then you go through and you look at the data with some some solid regression modeling, and it's, you know, unfortunately, being a lighting company, we can't go and change out the lights, so we got to look to people like Long to help us get down and figure out more more to uh, to help save on. Excellent. Um, so two more questions here I had for you. One is um, most people here have a building automation system. Can you explain? Um, what the difference that data that comes out of the automation system versus a platform such as this? Um, I feel like it's a common uh, misperception that the BAS can handle anything and everything. Yeah, so in, in this case, you know, the data you're looking at here is actually from utility bills. Uh, we, we actually can take that data from a utility bill through our integration um, with Distech and bring it back down to a building automation system and, and work more as a middleware. Um, but, you know, a lot of the, you know, more physical data that we're getting um, off a work order system, say, you know, off of, a, you know, a, a utility, we can actually integrate utility smart meter. Uh, it just, it kind of is a, you know, a, a, an additional data set. And again, with any disk like products, we, we actually can bring that data back down um, as, as to the to the, the building automation system. But it's definitely more of a, um, you know, a, an, an all encompassing, you know, uh, not, you know, not not necessarily control platform, but a, a more of a reporting visualization um, analysis tool set uh, than a than a than your traditional building automation system. Excellent. I love that. Uh, last question here is I would like to bring things uh, close to home. I know this platform was uh, recently implemented at the University of Colorado. Um, can you talk about what that process is like? Um, is it flipping a switch? Do I need extra hardware? Um, and then also briefly uh, explore how they use this platform for some of the indoor air quality um, topics that are on the next slide here. Yeah, yeah. so when we look at implementing uh, from a uh, a physical scoping um, perspective and actually taking data, say in a building automation system, any submeters you have on site, uh, any asset level data you like. Um, we, we always look to long as our boots on the ground. Uh, they are a partner um, that, that really helps us drive a customer experience with, with actual you know, people um, that can go out and, and check on the site and look at you know, what building automation system you have. Uh, what kind of data that we want to pull from that and what are your goals and then our team will work with them to help really drive those use cases and, and put together a roadmap of, of you know how we get to those goals over time and really balance you know the the, the hybrid model of you know um, a, a cloud platform um, you know like building OS with with you know local and, and regulations and, and all the things that you know, we can be helped out with um, you know in, in person. Um, as far as you know, looking to what we're doing with uh, you know a lot of people on the indoor air quality um, and, and really you know, trying to help with, with going back to the office. Uh, this is a big, like you said, at universities like um, Colorado University and, and you know different uh, K through 12, um, and as well as corporate office buildings. It's, it's a it's a big thing on people's mind. We get calls about it all the time, and we work with a lot of our partners. We've actually built out a number of integrations to facilitate that, um, including this integration, which is actually to a, a company called Senseware, which has an indoor air quality sensor, which can be installed and get you humidity, CO2, um, PM 2.5, VOC, and PM 10 data. Um, and from that, 
with the actionary recommendations, we can create these alerts, which really take into account, you know, when humidity is between 40 and 60%, CO2 is less than 700 ppm, and the PM2.5 is less than three micrograms per square meter, you know, that's your ideal conditions. And that's when you want, you know, people to be in this space and, and the, the lowest probability of transmission of these airborne particulates. Um, and as you can see, you know, we're alerting off that, all those downstream variables into one heat map to say, go no go of this space and, and this space from an air quality perspective, you know, it's pretty much no go. So it's good to have that data, um, but you know, you don't need that much data if, if you just want to get a kind of a, a, a more of a, a benchmark of you know CFM per person. Obviously, you know, the best way to to move that um, that those particulates out of space is just to crank the air through the space in the easiest way, um, which can be done with a flow station. And then we can look at you know general occupancy metrics and give you know your internal teams the idea of you know, what is the CFM per person? What's the air change rate? And, and alert on that in real time to make sure that you're maintaining those uh, safe spaces. And I would, you know, recommend reaching out to Long um, if you're interested in any of these dashboards or any more information on how we're, you know, taking those ASHRAE recommendations and, and actually putting them into action. It's definitely a powerful tool considering uh, the current times. I love that no go, no go kind of heat map there. Um, I, I can certainly see that being useful in a lot of different applications. So that is the conclusion of our show today. Andrew, thank you so much for joining. Appreciate all the guests out there as well. Thank you all and have a great day.